Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Lars Schall. I am an independent financial journalist from Germany and on behalf of Matterhorn Asset Management I welcome you to a special interview that I will now conduct with Keith Barron in Washington DC. Keith is an exploration geologist with almost 30 years of experience in the mining sector. Hi Keith. Hello there Lars. How are you? Very, very well, thank you. Okay, great. Let's start. Uh, why are you working in gold exploration and how did it all begin for you? Well, it, it all began for me a long, long time ago. Um, I was born in Canada, but I went to school in, in Great Britain and I took geology uh, as a, a course, a two-year course, in um, back in high school. and. Uh, the uh, it had just been introduced into the syllabus for the very first time and uh, it's an amazing thing there were four students in that class who all became professional geologists so i, I started very early and then when i, I went on to uh, to study at the university uh, eventually uh, taking my my uh, my doctorate uh, in geology working on a, a gold deposit uh, up near the red lake camp in canada and what was so fascinating about gold in particular? Well, I've always been very, very interested in it. Uh, my father had a very passionate interest in uh, in gold uh, as a uh, investment tool, and in fact, he started to buy it in 1966 before anyone really thought about it, and it was a constant uh, uh, a constant topic of discussion at the dinner table. Um, so when I started to uh, to do gold exploration for a living, uh, he uh, he very much encouraged what I what I did, and uh, I just found it a lot very fascinating, uh, a lot of interesting characters that I came across, and uh, it's been a very rewarding career for me. Um, I've not just worked in gold, but uh, in uranium and diamonds and many many other things, and uh, it's uh, taken me all over the uh, all over the planet. Is it harder to find gold these days compared to the past? Yes, I I really do believe that it is. Um, we have a saying in the business that a lot of the low hanging fruit is, has been picked. I think that's certainly the case um, in. Um, the mature uh, gold camps of the world, like uh, Kalgoorlie in Western Australia or Timmins in Canada, uh, it's getting much, much harder to find uh, gold deposits. You have to go deeper with drilling. Uh, you have to use a lot of expensive geophysics. And uh, it's not like the old days where you could just stroll around on the surface and, and make gold discoveries. Um, that still is possible in some of the frontier areas of the world and, and some areas that are, are really uh, less than attractive for exploration uh, where there's uh, war zones going on and things like that. Um, those are really uh, the, last, uh, the last frontiers to go and, and, and find the, uh, the very big gold deposits close to the surface, I believe. Is peak gold an issue for you, therefore? Uh, yes, very much so. In fact, I, I've lectured about this in several places around the world. Um, I, I really do believe that uh, we have seen uh, peak gold, and um, certainly a lot of the gold deposits being brought into production these days are um, around one gram one gram per ton. Uh, historically, uh, mining companies wouldn't touch such grades. Uh, reason being, there's very, very little uh, cushion. Um, you can't really go any lower. Uh, you always have to leave something uh, in the ground. Your recovery is never 100%. And uh, with one gram per ton, your margins are very, very slender indeed. If the gold price should go against you, uh, you really could put your, your company into uh, real jeopardy. Uh, but the problem is that there aren't that many uh, robust, uh, high-grade uh, gold deposits being found out there. Um, my own discovery at Fruta del Norte in Ecuador 
um, in in 2006. Is, uh, really, there's there's been uh, nothing since since then of a, a similar grade and a similar tonnage, um, and that's uh, that's very unfortunate. I think it's the fault of of um, the industry. Which has played a very, very conservative book, and uh, really doesn't want to spend money on grassroots exploration. Is peak gold something that an uh, investor should take into account? Uh, yes, I, I think so because um, the appetite for gold in in the uh, the Far East is voracious, and um, that's where the the bulk of uh, the newly mined gold is going, of course. And um, you know, uh, there's uh, gold is a finite thing. It's uh, what we call a wasting resource. When you open up a gold mine, eventually the mine's going to be exhausted. And uh, I, I think we have hit a time in world history uh, where uh, people will not be finding too many very, very large gold deposits going forward. And um, we'll just have an ever-diminishing number of um, smaller and lower-grade deposits to go after. Keith, why would you say are gold mining companies having a difficult time in general? Well, this is a legacy issue that goes back uh, about 10 years, uh, maybe 15 years, uh, when companies really believed that they had to be the biggest out there to attract the, uh, the interest and the attentions of the investors and of the fund managers out there. So there were a lot of um, companies that acquired uh, very, very low-grade resources or expended a lot of money on um, the uh, the low-grade envelopes of the deposits they already owed, uh, they own, uh, rather than going out and, and finding uh, newer and and high-grade uh, deposits. And of course, you know, there were a lot of people who thought the gold price was going to zoom uh, past two thousand dollars per ounce, and that didn't happen. And when the market turned the other way, uh, they got uh, they got caught short. The other thing that also happened was that. Um, companies became ac accountable uh, for their all-in costs uh, and they weren't really being upfront uh, with um, the total cost of mining gold. Uh, they gave us um, production costs and, and uh, they were hiding things on balance sheets and really uh, trying to disguise the fact that uh, for the senior gold producers uh, making uh, producing gold was not a very uh, viable business. Um, since then, um, a lot of uh, companies have shed uh, their less profitable assets. Uh, they've shrunk down in terms of resources and reserves, and uh, and they're, uh, I think, really they're high grading their ore bodies uh, to stay alive. Um, and how hard is it for them that the gold price is below the production costs? Well, yes, you know, when you're in a, situa a situation where uh, the gold price is below production cost, then uh, it's a very curious thing. So uh, it's a situation where they're high grade, going after the highest grades they have in their minds. Um, leaves them with very little cushion or none at all um, in go-forward basis. So I, I this is uh, this downturn that we've seen in the gold price that's uh, approaching uh, $1,200 right now per ounce. It's very, very scary for the senior mining companies. Will they do better in the future? Well, I think what we'll see is a, a lot of upheaval, a lot of volatility uh, amongst the, the, the senior gold miners. I would expect that some of them are going to, um, well, uh, 
we've already uh, had uh, a lot of discussion about Barrick and Newmont getting together. I could see um, companies like BHP or RTZ uh, going after some of the uh, the more productive uh, of the uh, the gold mines in the world uh, and gold companies. Um, and I think some other companies are going to get uh, going to get broken up. So I think some of them right now. Um, their uh, book value is uh, is lower now, and their stock market value is lower than uh, the replacement value of the asset, and that's really because uh, uh, the uh, market interest right now uh, in precious metals companies, unfortunately, is pretty low, uh, and that's because the Dow and the S and P are hitting uh, new highs every week. So uh, why would you put your money in? in to gold, uh, if uh, you know, you can almost uh, uh, guarantee that the U.S. Fed is going to uh, uh, keep your uh, um, keep your investment intact if you put it into the broad broad market equities in the uh, U.S. stock market. What do you think is crucial when investing in gold mining stock companies? Well, I I. Uh, I invest in both juniors and senior mining companies um, and in uh, royalty companies. I particularly like royalty companies because they they don't have a lot of exposure or any exposure really to um, any problems in the industries to do with um, workforces, uh, inflated production costs. Um, because they're diversified um, across the globe. The but I I really do like junior mining companies because of their uh, possibility of making very large discoveries and uh, you know um, going from uh, pennies to uh, to dollars in price. Uh, I think this is the main attraction for the mining sector, and it's something that a lot of people forget about. Uh, you know, every gold discovery, um, every mine that's out there was a discovery. And it was usually made by a small junior company that uh, ended up being acquired by a major company, and then the major company developed it. But when that uh, initial discovery was made, uh, probably that junior company doubled, tripled, and went up in value many, many times. And if you can identify these juniors early, uh, then you stand to make a very great deal of money. Do you trust the official numbers regarding the all-time stock of gold above ground, which would be roughly 170 to 180,000 tons? Um, I think that may be, may be accurate. Um, I don't think it's uh, it's overstated. Uh, it's understated. Um, I think uh, if anything, it might be overstated um, because I think a lot of the gold that's out there in the hands of central banks and possibly even the ETFs is being counted two or three times. Um, so um, I, you know, I think it's particularly telling uh, that. Uh, countries that have requested to have the gold repatriated uh, are not able to get it in a heartbeat. Uh, like Germany, of course, uh, the famous case where uh, they've requested part of their gold reserve to be returned by the U.S. and the U.S. said it's going to take seven years. Um, now, this is particularly telling. It tells me that that gold has been leased into the market and sold and that it's going to be difficult to, uh, to get it back. Um, so, you know, uh, I think a lot of the gold that out, is out there is actually uh, just a, a, a book entry. Um, it, it, it's not, uh, it doesn't have physical behind it. Does this have consequences for the gold price in the future? Well, yes, I think very much so. Um, I think that you'll increasingly uh, see countries uh, not uh, particularly trust the U.S. or maybe the British government and want their gold back. Um, and uh, it's, uh, I think it's got uh, very, very um, 
the the consequences for the gold price are enormous. Um, I think eventually, eventually, um, one of the ETFs out there will be shown to be um, lending out gold and not having the gold in the vaults that they say that they have. Um, it's there's just so so many of these things that have uh, have uh, shown up so much money uh, that's been uh, poured into them that I think the this will be some sort of fraud at, at some point. It seems too uh, too easy uh, to me. So uh, I think this is uh, one of the things that could uh, potentially uh, trigger a, a much higher price, a, a, a big scandal in the ETFs or uh, uh, one of the uh, countries going rogue and demanding all of its gold uh, back out of uh, uh, Western banks immediately. So I would think that you do not perceive the gold market as a free market. Oh no, I don't think it's been free for years. Um, and uh, the gold price is very much guided by the paper gold market, by the futures, and uh, not by physical. Uh, there's a real split here. Um, in um, periods over the last couple of years, it's been actually very difficult to accumulate a uh, large amount of physical gold. It's just been impossible to, to find it out there. Um, I think what happened uh, a while back with the, uh, the gold plunge from $1,900 uh, down to 1100 was an orchestrated attack uh, on the gold price uh, by the bullion banks. Um, we've got all kinds of smoking guns all over the place. Uh, we know that, uh, there were massive amounts of gold sent from uh, the UK to Switzerland uh, to be recast from 400 ounce good delivery bars into kilo bars, and the kilo bars is what the, uh, the Asian market prefers. And uh, so I think a lot of the bullion banks who have the capability of withdrawing uh, 50 billion from the ETFs uh, were arbitraging, making maybe 40, 50, 60 dollars per ounce and not really giving a damn about the price itself, but uh, trading the ETFs and sending money, uh, sending the gold uh, to the ETH. And that's where it is now. And it's not going to cut back out of there. Uh, in a heartbeat. It's gone to India, it's gone to China, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to uh, uh, to get the Chinese and the Indians to release that gold uh, back into the market. It's just not going to happen. It's, to all intents and purposes, it's off the books. But do you think uh, the day for physical gold will come and the paper market oh. will be crashed? I, I, I think the... Uh, the COMEX is, uh, is going to uh, come apart at some point. Uh, it wouldn't take uh, too much for somebody like a Warren Buffett or a Bill Gates uh, to, uh, to raid the COMEX and demand delivery, and uh, they cause all kinds of havoc. Uh, it, it's not going to take a huge amount of money these days because I think the physical is just not out there to be found. So uh, somebody will get wise to this, and, uh, you know, we could see uh, kind of like a bunker hunt thing uh, cornering uh, the gold market. The, the Hunt brothers did uh, with the silver market in 1980. And uh, some uh, make a huge amount of money. Uh, and it's going to be a rogue uh, foreign government. Uh, who knows? But uh, it's a very precarious situation, I think, uh, uh, with this uh, with this paper market, um, you know the the positions get rolled over. Um, there's no real uh, physical gold that has to be found to, to back all this stuff, and uh, the claims of three ounce of gold are, are more than uh, 100 times uh, the physical out there. So it's 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 a crazy situation. Could you tell us a little bit more about one aspect of a manipulated gold price? Namely, what does a suppressed gold price mean for third world countries in their mining business? 
Well, it's a real disaster for uh, some of the countries in in uh, developing countries like, say, Guyana or like uh, Ghana and West Africa. Um, you know, they're obviously not getting um, a, f a fair price uh, for the gold. And, uh, you know, uh, Cecil Rhodes said that uh, gold was the back backbone of all certainty. And he... Uh, uh, the the gold market and certainly gold discoveries uh, in the Rand in South Africa developed uh, uh, Johannesburg and uh, turned uh, South Africa into a modern state. Uh, who knows what it would be if if those gold discoveries were never made? Um, so I, I think uh, you know a lower gold price. Um, and of course, the, the margins have caught up um, with production everywhere, so none of these uh, mining companies or the, the companies are making huge, vast amounts of money from the gold business. Uh, I, think, uh, I think gold investors are being cheated, but I also think that uh, uh, these third world governments are, are being cheated because they're not getting a fair price. Is the stock-to-flow ratio that separates gold from other commodities? Well, there's uh, the gold supply is fairly inelastic. Uh, you can't just snap your fingers and produce more gold um, because it takes uh, it can't take a, a, a minimum of about five years, seven years to get a gold mine up and running. And uh, in some cases, it can take as much as 20 years with the permitting and all the rest of it. Um, you know, there's also this uh, this argument that all the gold that was ever mined is uh, is waiting to go back in the market. And uh, I, I really believe that's a fallacy. Uh, it's not like uh, people are going to go and throw it in their recycling bins. Um, a lot of the gold that has gone from the west to the east and we've seen i think the real uh, the the largest migration of real wealth in the history of the world uh in the last couple of years uh that gold is now in the form of, of dowries um it's in uh uh, ankle bracelets and, and rings on on the uh, fingers of Indian brides, and uh, it's, uh, it's been put away in cubby holes by aunties in in, in Hong Kong and Shanghai, and uh, it's just not going to come back into circulation uh, anytime soon. And do you see the East as the hub in the future for physical uh, exchange on gold? Uh, I think so. I think that uh, they will continue to develop Shanghai, uh, but also I think we see some other places um, springing up in the east, and uh, the market uh, show up in uh, in Dubai. Um, I know that uh, the Arab countries argued back and forth about a gold dinar for many years. Um, that certainly would be a very solid currency, um, and uh, the Arabs like to be paid for, for their oil and gold as well. Um, but uh, now gold is a very cultural thing in the East, Far East and the Middle East, and uh, the people have a, a very visceral appreciation for it. It's not like it is in the West, where it's considered to be an investment uh, instrument or, uh, you know, baubles and jewelry or what whatnot. Uh, uh, people really look to, to uh, uh, as the, uh, a preservation of wealth in the, uh, in the East. Uh, certainly, if you had gold uh, in Vietnam, uh, when the Americans left, um, you could uh, uh, use that gold to get out, and it was the only way that the boat people were able to get on rafts and boats and, and, and get to uh, uh, other countries and, and flee uh, uh, before the, uh, the Viet Cong. Um, in fact, they had uh, little gold bars that were uh, very, very thick almost paper thin and flat uh, that you could actually hide underneath your clothing. Um, you can still find these bars on uh, some of the uh, 
the websites. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's a very, very important, strong uh, cultural part of, uh, of life in, uh, in Far East and the Middle East. Do you think that uh, you will be able in the future to pay for commodities in gold, uh, for example, oil, hard asset for hard asset? I think that's uh, I think that's coming. Um, there are one or two countries that uh, already do that. I believe that Turkey's been paying for uh, their oil in gold, um, and. Uh, Uh, you know, the, the American dollar is in a precarious position because if the Chinese decide that they're going to get out of the American dollar, they're going to smash it. Uh, so it's kind of a, a mutual destruction thing right now. But it, it's not something that's going to last. I, I think eventually the, the Chinese uh, will abandon the U.S. dollar. Uh, the Chinese have been accumulating Uh, gold like uh, like crazy. Uh, I've seen one estimate that they have uh, uh, 12,000 tons in, in reserves now. Um, I wouldn't doubt it at all. And uh, so, you know, they uh, uh, I, I eventually they're they're going to have a, a very very strong currency. I think uh, uh, the uh, motivation behind this is to. Um, To really have the uh, the number one currency in the world and take over the 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 pole position of the U.S. dollar. Yeah, and where do you see gold heading to then, when this happens? Well, who knows? <laughs> um, we certainly know that if you were to take the gold supply, uh, all the gold above ground in the world, and uh, divide it up amongst the population of the world. Uh, then everyone gets uh, less than one gram. Uh, there's not a lot to go around. So um, where is the price going to head? Um, well, you know, in, in American dollar terms, uh, you know, the gold price is not going to go up. The dollar is going to drop. Yeah. So um, we could see, uh, I, I, I think uh, in my lifetime, uh, I'm certainly going to see $5,000 gold. I think it's uh, it's an inevitability. Why so? Well, um, you know, if history is any kind of a guide, um, certainly uh, since uh, Bretton Woods broke up, um, the gold prices has moved substantially from $35 an ounce to where it is right now. I think uh, what's happened, uh, happening right now in the gold market is um, just uh, a result of uh, manip manipulation by uh, the U.S. government with the interest rates and the QE. And, um, you know, the, uh, the banks are largely uh, playing the carry trade um, with, uh, with um, uh, European bonds. Um, the money that has uh, gone into QE is not going into the broad economy. Eventually it will, and then it will cause a lot of inflation. And, um, you know, the, just since 1975, the... The, uh, the 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 dollar has lost 90% of its purchasing power. Um, that's uh, that's during my lifetime. Uh, gold in, in 1975 was uh, uh, you know uh, pretty low, and uh, we're, I, I think that uh, we will play catch up. Um, we've had the these doldrums in the in the gold market for a couple of years now. But when um, that $3 trillion dollars that has been created uh, does filter into the broad economy, uh, it will produce a lot of inflation. And, uh, you know, it's a funny thing. The, the market is kind of uh, uh, schizophrenic. They, they, they don't uh, 
uh, they don't refer to history too much, but every time there's been uh, large inflation in the world, uh, the gold price moved ahead of that inflation because gold is considered to be a, a safe haven asset. I think that the powers that be, and I do believe that there's been manipulation, have been trying to kill gold. They've been trying to kill the Swiss franc as a... Uh, uh, as a safe haven. They've been trying to kill all the safe havens because they want the money to go into the broad stock market and, and consumer goods. But uh, this is not a sustainable thing. Yeah, but do you think the powers that be, uh, they themselves privately and silently are buying gold and silver? I wouldn't be at all surprised. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, um, it's, uh, it's, it's quite possible that uh, um, the Warren Buffetts of this world are, uh, are quietly accumulating. Who, who knows? Who knows? Um, it, it could be uh, uh, certainly going on. I think the more savvy uh, people out there have to uh, look at the, um, the alternative uh, and You know, it's obvious to everyone that this this QE, this injection of large amounts of money, which is going on worldwide right now, is going to end badly. And it's always ended in the past in, in inflation and eventually in hyperinflation. Uh, if you were able to accumulate gold right now, um, I, I'd be doing it. Yeah. And uh, are you also optimistic about silver or maybe even more so? Uh, I am op optimistic about silver, but, um, you know, silver is what they refer to as, as poor man's gold. And as gold gets more and more expensive, it becomes too expensive for um, the, uh, the typical investor to, to, uh, to purchase, to get involved in. So, um, you know, we saw this... Uh, Recently, when gold took its run up to $1,900, people started to buy silver um, simply because it was uh, a proxy for gold. So I, I th that's what will happen. Um, of course, silver has got many industrial uses that gold doesn't. Uh, it's it's produced as a as a byproduct of, of base metal production. Um, I'm not. I don't subscribe to the theory that uh, the silver gold ratio is going to go back to 13 to one or anything like that. Because I think that's a load of old rubbish. Um, but I, I do think that as the gold price moves ahead, the silver price will be carried along with it. Do we have a specific price target for silver? Oh, <laughs> no, well, I think that's a very dangerous thing to do, especially that this is being recorded. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, I, I, you know, I, I hold silver bullion. I'm a, a believer in it. It's part of my, uh, my investment portfolio. And um, I, I do believe that I'm going to, uh, to do very well with it. Okay, and how about uh, mining companies in silver? Um, I own a, a couple of um, silver mining companies. I think that they're all kind of uh, depressed in price right now. And uh, I, I actually think it's, uh, it's quite a, a good opportunity to, uh, to buy these. Okay, and do you think, uh, coming back to gold, uh, do you think with the mining companies one could make uh, actually gain more than with the physical gold? Uh, well, in the past, um, the, um, the mining companies have outperformed uh, the price when, when there's been a sudden run-up. Um, but remember, uh, things are a little bit different now because people can buy ETFs very easily. Um, and, uh, and so they, they buy the ETFs rather than buying the, the physical bullion or maybe even rather than buying um, the uh, the mining companies because uh, obviously they're not uh, subject to all the the potential problems that uh, are out there with uh, strikes by the workforce or cave-ins in a mine or confiscations by foreign governments or whatever. Um, so um, I think that uh, there are some companies out there. Uh, I wouldn't want to name them, but some of the very big majors uh, that 
um, have got some assets that are very poor uh, and are not going to be mined uh, in the near future, if ever at all. Um, they, they're just very, very poor investments that they got involved in. Um, and I would shy away from them. Um, I think uh, I would prefer some of the mid-tier companies uh, rather than some of the, the very senior gold companies. Um, and, uh, uh, and I like the royalty companies too. Yeah. Uh, since you mentioned the ETFs, do you think that in lots of investors in ETFs will be uh, ruined in the future? Well, um, I, I do think that there will be a scandal in one of them. And I don't know who and I don't know when, uh, but something will, will blow up. And, you know, we've had a couple of situations in the past. There was a problem with, uh, with, with uh, Scotiabank, I believe, um, and uh, they, they wouldn't let the gold out of their vaults. Um, there was a mismatch with one of the, uh, the Dutch banks. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if any of these things will eventually uh, bring down uh, any of these uh, ETF uh, funds. But uh, uh, certainly, uh, if there is a scandal, uh, a big scandal in any of them, uh, then they'll be become untouchable. Um, I don't like the fact of having somebody else uh, holding my gold in, in, in their vault. Um, I have to put all my faith in, in, in them. Um, and uh, I think uh, it's a much better idea to, uh, to hold physical bullion. Yeah, um, this is maybe also a thought that the people in Switzerland have. Because you're supporting a specific gold-related campaign in Switzerland. Please tell us about it. Yes, very much so. It's uh, the, the Swiss Gold Initiative. Um, and uh, I live in Switzerland. Um, I certainly have a lot of respect for the Swiss and, uh, and their, their very strong work ethic and their believers in, in sound money and a, a sound currency. However, uh, in the last few years, um, things have started to, to fall apart to some extent because of the peg with the euro. So um, the gold levels backing the currency in Switzerland, the Swiss franc, and Switzerland does not use the euro as currency. I want to make that clear. Um, the Swiss franc was more than 40% backed by gold. Um, there was a change to the constitution a few years back and the level dropped to about 20%. There was a, a, a massive sale of gold, about a thousand tons of gold was sold by the Swiss National Bank uh, at uh, about the same time that Gordon Brown was selling the reserve in the UK uh, and they got uh, not a very good price for it. Um, if they'd held on to that gold it uh, would be worth uh, a considerable um, a greater amount uh, today, but it's it's gone. So uh, the Swiss Gold Initiative has got uh, three uh, things behind it, uh, three uh, points that are going to go uh, to the polls. Uh, November, I believe the date's November the 30th. Um, the Swiss people are going to vote on this. Uh, the first point is that uh, the uh, the gold uh, currency uh, should be back 20%, or, or the Swiss franc should be back 20% by gold. So, uh, 20% of the uh, the foreign reserve uh, held by Switzerland should be held uh, in uh, in the held as gold. Uh, second is that uh, uh, the gold sitting outside of Switzerland's borders should be repatriated. Uh, it's sitting in Canada and the UK right now uh, and there is no good reason uh, for it uh, to be there. Uh, I believe that the, uh, it, the intention at the, the time when it went there uh, was to uh, uh, keep it out of the hands of, uh, of uh, Russia uh, if they ever threatened Western Europe uh, during the Cold War. But all that evaporated now. And there's no good reason for it to be outside of the borders. So that's, uh, 
that's the second important point. The third important point is uh, that uh, uh, Switzerland doesn't make any more gold sales. So they keep their, uh, uh, their gold reserve uh, as it is right now intact. And it, because of uh, this very, very dangerous experiment uh, with the, uh, uh, the uh, euro, with the peg, uh, the gold backing of the Swiss franc has shrunk to only 8%. 8%, it's absolutely uh, uh, extraordinary uh, that uh, a, a country that uh, valued frugality and sound money and all the rest of it has let this happen. And, uh, you know, the, the Swiss National Bank has uh, gone ahead and, and, and done this uh, without the mandate of the people. So they're going to be called to the, the carpet on, on November the 30th, and potentially they're going to have to uh, find uh, that gold back in, uh, from the marketplace and, and restore uh, really what it's the patrimony of the Swiss people uh, that has been squandered uh, to uh, support the euro and support the pig countries, uh, support the economies of Portugal and Spain and Malta and Cyprus and all these uh, other European countries which have uh, been very profligate uh, with uh, with their money. Um, the Swiss are the very opposite, and uh, unfortunately, uh, they're the ones who have been made to uh, to pay for this uh, huge fiasco of an experiment, which is uh, the euro. I, I really believe that the euro is doomed. Uh, it's going to break apart. Um, and uh, when it does, uh, it could be really, really disastrous for Switzerland because Switzerland holds so many of the damn things in their foreign reserve. So uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm a real uh, champion for the Swiss Gold Initiative, and uh, I really hope it succeeds. Uh, talking about the second point of the initiative, would you say a real gold reserve is only a gold reserve that you have completely on your own soil at your own disp uh, at your own disposal at any time? Yeah, I certainly do believe that. You know, the one who started off uh, uh, the repatriation of the gold was Hugo Chavez in, in Venezuela, who demanded that uh, foreign gold be. Uh, foreign health will be returned uh, uh, to the uh, the Bank of Venezuela. Um, I don't see any reason uh, why it should be outside the the hands of the Swiss. Um, we know that uh, from history, uh, you got to go back a little while, but uh, when uh, uh, in uh, the the Bank of Portugal uh, had. Uh, 17 tons of gold that was leaked out um, to um, uh, one of the bullion banks that failed, uh, and it never they never got it back. It was gone. It's like it evaporated. Um, and uh, you know we don't know if the uh, the Brits or the Canadians uh, who are holding um, massive amounts of, of the Swiss gold reserve. Uh, have been lending it out. Uh, is it uh, has it been lent out? Has it been sold? Is it still there? Um, nobody's conducted an audit, and uh, we don't have um, don't have uh, numbers of the bars or anything like that. Um, we know that uh, in the case of Germany, uh, the small amount of German gold that has been repatriated, um, the bars that came back were not the bars that went out. So obviously there was a lot of uh, shenanigans that went on and, and that gold that uh, was placed uh, for safekeeping in America uh, was sold and uh, different gold substituted for it eventually. So, uh, no, I, I think that uh, any sovereign country should have uh, their, uh, it's the property of the people and it should be within the borders. Yeah, but what does this tell you then that Germany has such, uh, such difficulties related to its gold? Well, it tells me that the gold sold. 
the gold was lent out into the market and it's been sold and uh, it's maybe been hypothecated eight or ten times and uh, lent out to various people and to uh, unwind all those trades is going to take time and uh, just finding the physical gold in the market is also going to take time um, so this is the reason that uh, that uh, they can't return the gold quickly um, you know it's it's not a physical thing that they, they just can't load the plane quickly enough and send it over to Germany. That's, it, it's utterly ridiculous. And, uh, you know, obviously the, the American government has not come up with uh, any, uh, any sort of a, um, an excuse uh, for uh, not repatriating the gold uh, quickly. Uh, it's just something they, they refuse to comment on. But you think uh, in the event that the uh, euro splits up, uh, Germany needs the, the gold? Oh, yes. Yes, I, I, uh, and I think that's one of the uh, incentives to get the gold back. Um, I think uh, countries are being uh, more and more distrustful of, of the motives of uh, their neighbors or or of the uh, the main powers and uh, I don't see any reason why uh, uh, Germany shouldn't get its uh, its gold reserve back and I think that um, the uh, uh, you know obviously uh, countries like Greece countries like France uh, Spain would love to have their own currency back so that they can inflate it and make a lot of their problems go away um, but I do think that we could see um, other behavior go on here um, and you could see a country like Austria or Finland uh, pull out of the euro first uh, simply because their politicians are uh, not prepared to support um, the uh, the southern Europeans anymore so the the ultimate breakup of uh, of the euro could come from uh, any real um, any real source. Yeah. Okay, Keith. I thank you very much for this interview. Okay. Thank you very much, Lars. It was very pleasant to talk to you. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>